Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today with Peter Gray. Peter is a researcher, professor at Boston College, and author of Free Toulon book. Welcome, Peter. I'm very happy to be here. It's nice to meet you. We just talked a little bit before the I press the record button, and I was just saying how amazing it is to be able to connect in some new ways, thanks to technology, and have this conversation about, I guess, our children playing free without technology. <laughs> <laughs> and being just outside and uh, and playing would you would you mind telling us why those themes in the first place become important to you why <laughs> why play well you know <laughs> in, in some ways in some ways i think it's if i think it's pretty obvious to everybody right i mean play is what in some sense makes life worthwhile. I mean, life would be pretty dreary without play, right? I mean, but life, kind play. Of underestimated. I mean, we see children play and what do we say? We say they do nothing, they play. I mean, it can be interrupted at any moment because this is shower time, this is dinner time because they do nothing, they just play. <laughs> That's exactly right. We, we give such a low priority to play and yet it, is especially for children that's what we should be giving the highest priority to mm -hmm. play play is what makes children happy play is but much more than that play is how children acquire the basic kinds of skills that are really really important um, for well-being throughout life these are skills that cannot be taught in school. They can't be taught by lecture. They're skills that children can only learn through experience. And for children, that experience is play. So how did you come to realize that? I mean, on a personal level, <laughs> we all know it kind of in theory, but why, why this matter was I don't know, so dear to you. Why not, I don't know, children discipline or <laughs> why play? I, th I think that there are several reasons why it became dear to me. Um, the, the most uh, immediate reason in some sense, uh, the reason that led me to begin to focus my research on um, play and as a vehicle for self-directed learning for children uh, came many years ago um, when my own son was rebelling in school as a young child and um, we found a very alternative school setting for him called the Sudbury Valley School which I've written about and conducted research on and um, this is a school where children are free to play and explore and do what children naturally do uh, throughout the day, every day during, during the school day uh, in uh, an environment where there are children from age four on through the teenage years, where there's lots of interesting things to do. And um, my, uh, I got interested in that school partly as a concerned father, you know, is he going to uh, learn what he needs to know to, for example, go on to higher education if he wants to later on, or if he will he learn what he needs to go to live a satisfying, meaningful adult life. So uh, I ended up doing uh, many years ago a study of the graduates of that school, and they were doing very, very well in life, uh, better than I would have guessed, and. Um, that led me to then question, well, what, what have they done? What have they learned? How have they learned all that they learned? How did they acquire the abilities that have led them to be such successful adults? And so then, uh, along with a graduate student, um, we did uh, observational research at this school. And of course, when children are free to do what they want, they spend huge amounts of time playing. <laughs> and so we were really observing play and observing it in a way 
that normally we don't look at play. We just say, oh, you know, they're just playing. Mm -hmm. But we were really looking when they're, quote, just playing. What are they actually doing? And, you know, when you really can attend without being too obviously present, because that interferes with the play. But if you can really kind of be a fly in the wall and watch children play, you'll be amazed at what they're doing. <laughs> you'll be amazed at the sophistication of what they're doing and what they're learning in, in the process of play. So that was the immediate thing that led me to study play. But I'll, I'll mention a couple of other things also that I think prepared me for this study. One is, you know, I grew up, uh, I'm old enough uh, that I grew up uh, at a time when children still had lots of opportunities to play. Uh, I don't know about where you are, but here in the United States, uh, there has been over decades uh, huge changes in children's lives. Um, when I was a child in the 1950s, uh, moms regularly said, get outdoors. I don't want you in the house, <laughs> you know? And there were actually, it was kind of the early part of the baby boomer period. So there were a lot of kids. And so you'd go outdoors and automatically there'd be kids to play with. And we spent huge amounts of time to play. I now know that that's normal childhood. That's the way children in hunter-gatherer cultures spend their time and so on. But um, that was the environment I grew up in. And it turns out we moved a lot from place to place. And so every place that I moved to, the children played in different ways. And so I had a lot of experience with children playing and I, and I kind of, and then, and then at some point I became, a, when I was in high school, I became a camp director, a waterfront director at, at camp. So I had lots of, and at that time, camps were largely places to play. I was on the waterfront most of the day and kids would come and they'd play in the water and with the boats and so on. It wasn't lessons, they were just playing. So I had lots of opportunity to, observe children playing. And then when I was a student in college, I had part-time jobs as kind of a director of a assistant director of a youth center where kids were just free to play. And so I had a lot of opportunity to observe play there too. And so I have had in the in my early experiences lots of opportunity to observe play. And at some point, um, uh, really a couple of decades ago, it struck me that children today don't have the freedom to play that I had when I was a kid or even that I observed when I was a young adult or even that my own son had uh, in the 1970s that this has been taken away from children and I began to get really interested in well, what are the consequences of that? And it turns out that we now know that um, over the same period of time that we've been greatly restricting, with every decade more and more restrictions on what children are free to do on their own, um, we've seen huge increases in anxiety and depression, even, um, heaven forbid, suicide among school-aged children and teens. And um, so I have been conducting research and writing um, that shows that there is very likely a strong cause effect relationship here, that when you take away children's play, you remove a major source of joy from their life and you also remove the, ac the very activity that allows them to create the mental resources to deal with stressful situations. That's part of what children are learning when they're playing independently of adults. They're learning how to solve their own problems. They're learning they can take charge of their life. They're learning they can deal with bullies. <laughs> you know, they don't always have to talk to an adult. They can, um, you know, they they can uh, play in risky ways and survive it. Right and. So these are very important lessons that cannot be taught, that have to be learned by children through independent play and other independent activities. So this is a major message that has come to me um, through my research and through my analysis of other people's research. So you said so many things that 
resonate with me. So first of all, when we ask, so when we see children play and we ask like, what do they do all day long, <laughs> just playing? My first thought was, they are kind of reproducing life as if they know it. So every time they acquire a new knowledge about life, they put it into play and they play it and they see how it works. Let's see, they see the parents fight. <laughs> They're gonna go and play and see how that social interactions, you know, work for them. <laughs> do they get to say what they want to say? Do they have to be the one who is apologizing? Or let's say they learn some new stuff about, I don't know that I put an apple in the air, let it go and it falls on the ground. And they go and play that and see how that works, like how physics works in my play. So I agree when you say that they kind of, play life i mean they play how to live how to interact with life that's happening all around them that's very well said and i i agree completely i i i often say that play takes place uh in a play world separate from the real world in children's minds but it's always almost always about the real world <laughs> It is how children learn to deal with the real world. It's sort of a practice world. It's sort of let's bring these ideas into this safe place to play with these ideas. Let's play with uh, fear. Let's play with the with witches and dragons and <laughs> terror. Let's play with the idea of parents who aren't getting along with one another, as you just suggested. Mm -hmm. Let, let's play. You know so. Play is not always happy scenes. It's uh, whatever it is that children are experiencing, they often bring that into play. But children also play regularly at kinds of all of those basic activities that human beings have to learn no matter where they're growing up. So you could, you know, anthropologists sort of classify different functional types of play. And if you look at those, which children play at everywhere in the world when they have ample opportunity to play. And if you look at those, they match so closely on the skills that human beings everywhere have to learn. So children play at language. Children learn language through play. The very first cooing and babbling is uh, playful. The very first use of words are, they're not asking for something, they're just using the words in a playful way. Children, so, you know, language is a human ability. We don't teach children their native language. They learn it, and they learn it through playful, playful playing with the sounds, playing with the meanings, and so on and so forth. And as children get older, and they're playing with one another, they're using language all the time because they have to communicate with one another about what they're doing, who gets to be what, what's fair, what's not mm -hmm. fair. There's actually research showing that children's language when they're playing with other language, other children is far more sophisticated than when they're talking with adults. Wow. You know, we, we adults tend to ask stupid questions to little children like, what color is that? Or, you know, <laughs> that doesn't lead to much interesting language. But when a child is playing with another child and says, hey, I get to wear that necklace this time. You wore it last time. That's real language. That's real communication. And they're, and they're motivated to get their point across. So there's real discussion going on and, and negotiation going on. So at children, so children play, uh, we are the animal that builds things and children all over the world play at building things, constructive play, researchers call it. We are the animal that's capable of imagination. As far as we know, we're the only animal that's capable of imagination. What we call higher order thinking involves imagination. If this were true, then what else has to be true? Children, including three and four year olds are playing with imagination like that all the time. What if uh, we're a troll under the table <laughs> you know what would that mean well we better not go under the table or we better give the troll a cookie so it doesn't eat us this is hypothetical deductive reasoning the highest level of human reasoning and little children are practicing it in play um we are uh, and we are uh, an animal that uses tools and children 
naturally want to play with the tools that are important to their culture. Uh, Hunter-gatherer children play with bows and arrows and digging sticks and children in agricultural cultures are drawn to farming equipment. Children in our culture, what are they drawn to? Computers, of course. That's uh, it's by far the, the major tool of our culture today. So no surprise that children are drawn to playing with computers and become very good at them, often picking up computer skills far before their parents do. So that's the, uh, you know, so, and most of all, we are social animals. Our whole, uh, the foundation for our happiness in life depends more than anything else upon our ability to get along with other people. We're just not happy alone, right? We just, we don't function well alone. Uh, and to, and so we need to know how to pay attention to other people's needs, to uh, accommodate other people's needs, to negotiate so our needs are met while the other person's needs are also met. These are things that children are always practicing in social play. They have to, you know, that as I often say, the biggest freedom in play is freedom to quit. Mm -hmm. So if you and I are children and we're playing together, and I'm a little bit of a bully, I just want it all my way. You as a self-respecting child will say, well, I'm going home now. <laughs> I'm not gonna play with you if you're gonna be like that. And you may not even articulate it. You just may say, well, I hear my mom calling, I'm leaving now, <laughs> but I get the picture. <laughs> and I begin to learn through that experience that if I wanna play with you, I'm gonna have to, be a little more attentive to what your desires are. I can't just always get my way. What an important skill to learn. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and you can't really teach that skill. You can lecture all day about it, but it's the practical experience that children have with other children that learn, leads them to develop and cultivate that skill. How to even notice the nonverbal expressions of whether your playmate is having fun or not having fun. Exactly. And then how to modify so that your playmate is having fun. This is, I, I'm, I would suggest that this is maybe the most important human skill there is. Way more important than knowing how to read and write. And yet we take away play. <laughs> so children can spend yet more dreary hours on reading and writing things that they when they're ready to learn they can pick up very quickly without without all those dreary hours <laughs> and when we become those adults that we are who are deadly serious about everything in life all is deadlines all is you know commitment all is long working hours <laughs> and there is no more joy in our lives no more play I think that's exactly right. And I think that um, all of us, uh, regardless of our age, could uh, be living happier. And I would even argue more productively in the end if uh, we had a more playful attitude about what we're doing. You know, one thing that I discovered uh, that I've found in my studies of uh, young people who grew up um, outside of uh, conventional curriculum-based schooling. They went to the kind of school that my son went to, or they were homeschooled uh, and given lots of freedom uh, to choose what they were doing. I found that um, a very high percentage of them, probably about 50% by my estimate, are in adulthood pursuing careers that they are really passionate about, that to them are play, and they develop that passion in play as children. So they discovered in play what they love to do. Through play, they became good at it. And then they found a way of making a living doing it as adults. So what fortunate people they are because the way they're making their living is not trudging off to some job that they, that, that they don't enjoy, it is doing what they most enjoy it is pursuing a passionate interest but now they're also making money doing it and supporting themselves and their family doing what they love to do uh, if we allowed our children more opportunities for play we would find more people in careers that they love and fewer in careers that they don't like <laughs>
I remember one day I was in the kitchen preparing dinner and my son just was, he was next to me doing his um, homework. And so I, I noticed him, he was reading something and then he was gone. I was like, where are you? And I saw him in the living room he played with this yo-yo, you know, the thing you throw and then it's kind of round ball and tours around the rope. And of course, like, yes. Yeah, and I was like, are you finished yet for your homework? Or have you done your reading? He was like, no, but I'm thinking about the answers. I was like, interesting. <laughs> play when he has to make his brain work or because he was reading a book and then he had to find who the main character was and how did the story go. So he would read, uh, uh, I don't know, a page maybe, and then he would go and play with his yo-yo and look for the answer, and then he would come back, write it down, and when he off again, <laughs> I was like, that's interesting. So he even uses play to when he has to really reflect on something. That's very interesting, and I, it fits with observations I've made too, and uh, reports I've heard. I, you know, I did a kind of an informal study a few years ago in which I asked uh, parents who are homeschoolers of their children about uh, their children's um, learning of mathematical skills, where how they kind of picked them up on their own. And I kind of heard story after story about how my child learned to count. When he was learning to count, it always involved bouncing on the couch. He was jumping up and down on the couch and counting his jumps you know that i think i think kids and maybe boys especially but girls also um you know you almost have to be moving to kind of move your brain too <laughs> and yet here we are we expect kids to sit quietly in their seats at school this is not normal child behavior um even if you're trying to solve some, maybe especially if you're trying to solve some problem, even I, you know, when I, when I get stuck on something, I'm writing an article and I just don't know how to, how to present something, or I'm thinking through some problem that to me is a pretty serious problem, I'll go out and take a bicycle ride and I can think better <laughs> when I'm riding my bicycle than I can when I'm just trying to sit and think, <laughs> you know, so I think, I think this characterizes all of us to a degree, maybe some of us more than others. I um, <clears throat> remember you told how you played when you were young and I grew up the same way. I grew up in a, like outside the town in a small village. And um, my parents would often say, go out and play, get out of our way. <laughs> get exactly. Out and, play. Right. and we are playing outside um, because we have outside. I mean, if you live in the middle of a city, maybe it's hard to have a space to play. So we, we had all those fields and cows and, and that was our battlefield. I mean, we had this imagination, you know, who ran wild and um, but now I hear parents like worrying, but you know, but they, they, I guess they, they are, I don't know, maybe books they read about how now we have to be in connection with our children and parents read that message directly, meaning I have to play with them. And often they'd say, but I don't enjoy playing with kids because you know, this is kids games. I, I don't like that anymore i don't want to play with them so what do you think about that do we have to play with our children i i think that this is a um a problem that has arisen because we're living in a world especially here in the united states i don't know so much about lithuania but in the united states we're living in a world where children are not just naturally in contact with other children. And so we begin to feel like we have a responsibility to play with our children. And we also overemphasize the, re the relationship between 
adults and children, we don't emphasize, you know, maybe because every, all of us are adults, we think we're so important to children, right? But if you really were to ask children, and children could give you the honest answer, they care more about their relationships with other kids than they do about their relationships with adults, even about their own parents. Now, in the long run, of course, they love their parents. They know they depend upon their parents. It would be a tragedy if they lost their parents. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they're not so concerned about connecting with their parents as they are concerned about connecting with their peers. And well, that should be because their peers are their future mates, their future friends, their, fu their current friends and fu their future work partners. That's the group they need. They need to know how to get along with people who are on the same level as they are, not with authority figures who are bigger, stronger, sometimes smarter <laughs> you know, than they are. They need to get along with their peers. And, um, and so, so, we, so, so many people, so parents have this view that, that they are the be all and end all in how their children are developing. And so parents keep thinking, I've got to do more and more and more. I've got to do this for them. I've got to make sure they do their homework. I've got to make sure they eat only the proper foods. God forbid if my child eats a non-organic grape, you know, or, you know, we get these ideas in our heads that somehow our, their children's lives are going to be ruled if we're not perfect parents. And we drive ourselves and our kids crazy when we do that. Right. So then we also have this idea we're supposed to play with our children. So I, I used to get a lot of questions about, uh, and I still do, about from parents like, should I play with my child? How should I play with my child? And so on and so forth. So I wrote a blog post for people who are interested. You could probably find it on a blog. I'd write a regular blog for Psychology Today magazine. And I wrote a post a few years ago called uh, playing with your children something title something like that you can google it peter gray playing with your children psychology today and uh, to prepare my first self for the post i googled uh playing with my children i just googled it and i came up interestingly with a lot of comments mostly from moms saying i know i'm supposed to play with my child but to be honest, I hate playing with my child. <laughs> and so here they are, they're playing with their child and they're not enjoying it. And of course it's not play if you're not enjoying it. And it's not even play for your child if the partner is not enjoying it. So when I read these, I realized what's happening that the moms understand they're supposed to play with their child and they also believe that they're supposed to let the child take the lead. Well, so they're letting the child take a lead in a way that, that no child would allow the child to take the lead. So one mom said, so my, my, so my child wants to play this game. It, it, she described the game. It involves sort of spinning some kind of a hoop with your foot. And she said, admittedly, for the first hundred times, it was fun. But then it really got boring. And this is all my child wants me to play. <laughs> so, you know, if, a, if another child was bored, the child would say, hey, you know, we're going to play something else or I'm going home. <laughs> you know, but, so and another mom wrote, so my child wants to play this make believe game. But my child tells me exactly what I have to say and when I say it. <laughs> and this is no fun for me. <laughs> and again, you know, my response is no child, no child playmate would accept that. Mm -hmm. And what and what you're doing when you agree to that is you're kind of teaching your child to be a little bully. <laughs> you know, you're trying to teach your child that you'll do whatever your child wants you to do, even if you don't want to do it, and even if it's no fun. So I think that I think that it's okay to play with children, but it's very important to play only in ways that is really play for you as well as your child. I also wrote there, I think that, that the kind of mistake I've just described of giving the child too much power and not negotiating about what you're playing, I think the, I think the, opposite might be true in some cases more for fathers. So the typical scene of a father playing with a child 
is, all right, we're going to make this Lego construction together, right? And pretty soon, it's the father doing it. <laughs> the father is so much better at this, and he's into it, and the kid is kind of left out in the sidelines, and maybe the father says, now put the brick here, <laughs> but that's so, no longer play for the child. So I think it's important. I think there are some ways to play with kids that are fun for everybody but i also think it this should be this should be a kind of this should be not the bulk of the child's play this should just be sort of now and then fun family fun helps bring the family together one way that i used to like to play when i was younger with kids was a kind of rough and tumble play tossing the kids up in the air men like to do this dads do this more than moms throughout the world they do wrestling rough housing with the little kid you know i'm a monster i'm gonna catch you and eat you for breakfast <laughs> you know and the child runs away screaming and laughing and you know this is uh, this is a way that you know the imbalance of the big guy and the little <laughs> and the little yes. kid can both be having a great deal of fun i think there are certain family games as long as everybody's enjoying there are certain at a certain age you know there are certain card games and board games maybe even video games that um that everybody enjoys and that are not so competitive that that even a seven-year-old has a chance of winning if there is winning and losing in the game. Um, I remember very much as a child enjoying, um, in our family, we played the big game at that time was Canast. It was a card game that it has a certain degree of skill to it, but also a lot of luck. And by age seven, one can, if you're into it, can be about as good as anybody at it. And we used to like to play Canasta um, as a family. And it would sort of be something that brought us together and we would laugh. And it wasn't, you know, because we all know there's a big element of luck to it. It wasn't like it really matters much if you have won or lost, but it's interesting. There's a certain amount of skill involved in it. And it, it's, uh, it's an excuse for us to sit together and do something all together. So I think those things are, are very valuable, but, but playing with ch children, playing with their parents should not be the major part of their play. I, I remember when, uh, uh, so I grew up with card games too. We used to play that with our parents. And then I enjoy that doing it with my kids. I mean, that's the yes. game I could play a lot. But then they come and ask for some other game I'm not enthusiastic about. I remember feeling, you know, this guilt, like, but I should do that. I mean, it's so nice of them asking me, I should do that. And then I would look at my children. I have a son and a daughter and they are, they, are, they have very similar age. So they often play together and um, I would look at them and I would observe that when one of them doesn't want to play the game, he says to the other one, I don't want to play this game. Right. And then he would take it like normally. He wouldn't be insulted. He wouldn't right. feel humiliated. <laughs> and my right. other kids wouldn't feel guilty because he doesn't want to play his game. I was like, why I'm doing, why I'm not doing the same? I should also be able to just say, no, I'm not interested in throw this game. We could play cards. That's fun to me. But then yeah. or we could go for a walk or we could go for right. a bike ride. That I can do because that's a lot of fun to me. But then this game, no, I'm sorry, but no. So because children take that very naturally. Someone saying no, it's OK, that's that's a no. That's, right. That doesn't mean anything else. Yeah. Right. I think it's important to establish that. I mean, the relationship between parents and children, we need to think in both directions about uh, independence and freedom. You're connected, you're very interdependent, but at the same time, you have certain rights and your child should have certain rights and you should respect those rights. And you're not your child's servant. <laughs> yeah. You're your child's mom, you're not a servant. <laughs> You're not there to be ordered around. <laughs> You're not there to be told that you you should play this game with me, even if you don't enjoy it, because I'm want asking you to play this game. That's not helpful to the child's long-term development. The child, on the other hand, does need people who want to play the kinds of games that you as an adult may, might not want to play, but another child might want to play. And that's why 
I think at least in the United States, I think the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenges at least for parents is to find the kind of setting where your child can be involved with a lot of other children in a free play situation where there aren't um, adults directing what they're doing and the adults are, and the children have plenty of opportunity to work things out and play and make friends and interact in their own ways. That's becoming more and more difficult here in the United States because we don't just send children outdoors and you send your child outdoors and there's nobody there to play with. We also in the United States have these irrational fears of the dangers of being outdoors and so we we, you actually could be accused of child neglect for sending your child outdoors, things that parents regularly did in the past. Um, we're actually trying to, through an organization that I'm part of called Let Grow, we're actually trying to change uh, state laws that give uh, parents more freedom to send their children outdoors and to trust that something is safe, that parents are the best judge of whether their child is capable of doing something or not and whether the neighborhood is safe enough uh, for the child to be out there playing independently. Um, so that's something that this is true I know in a lot of Europe I have no idea to what degree it's true uh, where you are. But I guess it's also true in big cities because it's always the same problem. First of all yeah. there's no place for it. I mean there's no like cities are not built for children. <laughs> they That's are right. built for adults. So there are streets, like big streets, but there's not maybe enough or but like public space for children to play and to be safe in those places. So but if you live outside the town, then it's more easier to connect. Like let's say we live in a small neighborhood. So right. my children grow up the same way I grew up. They have their neighbor's friends right. and they all play together. We just open the gate. We all gather in a street across the street where it's like a wild field. And they go right. there, they run and they play whatever they want to play. Uh, but also I, I hear parents saying that, okay, I let's imagine my children come home and I tell them, you are free to go and play whatever you want. And my child would tell me, mom, I don't want to know what to play, I'm bored. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> how do we address that? I mean, how do we right. reintroduce the free play? Because now right. children are so used to be entertained. You know, they're so used to be, right. you know, brought from one after school activity to another. And then there is always an adult who's telling what to do, how to do. But they don't know how to play anymore alone. Right. Yeah, I think that, um, so I'm a big believer in boredom. I think boredom is good for us. <laughs> it's sort of, uh, boredom is the message uh, that that if you get bored enough, you, you say, okay, what am I gonna do to overcome this boredom? I don't think you should have to rely on uh, somebody else to tell you what to do. Um, the, um, the, um, the you know one you know one reasonable response is well if you're bored uh, maybe you you could clean the living room for me or <laughs> wash the dishes you know? clean the house <laughs> clean the house um, uh, this will <laughs> you know, well, that's a good one <laughs> this might um, this might lead them to think of something else they would want to do so I, it's one it's one kind of reasonable approach I think I don't think it's I think that it's not our job to amuse our children all the time and i think and i think that's part of the problem they're not children are often not learning how to find their own interests and develop their own interests because they expect other people to um to amuse them to provide it for them um it's interesting at this school that my son uh went to the sudbury valley school the founder of the school uh, daniel greenberg would often say that he'd often point out and i would observed it in my observations that oftentimes new students would come to the school and they would um and they would not get involved in anything. They would just sit there and say, oh, it's so boring here. There's nothing to do. Even though there's all these other kids doing all these other interesting things, they just these often would be teenagers and they were kind of burned out and negative about the world. And they would just be sitting there. And, um, 
and what Greenberg would say is the worst thing to do would be to go and help them get over that problem, to suggest things to do. Let them just sit there and be bored. <laughs> and they may do that for months, <laughs> but over time that gets pretty tiresome. And moreover, they're in this environment where they're seeing all these other kids around and interesting things to do. And at some point they start taking control of themselves and start taking initiative and doing something. So, um, so even in that setting is possible. Of course, today, if there's any, I'm a big supporter of video games and use of the internet for kids. I think it can be very, very helpful and, they're, and the games are amazing and the communication is to feel, but if there's a downside, it is that potentially this is always a source of amusement <laughs> mm -hmm. that prevents you from kind of thinking of other ways of, of doing things. And, and I think that there is a bit of a problem there. Um, I'm not a, always quite sure what to do with it. I changed my story on this somewhat, to be honest, <laughs> over time, but it also depends a lot on, on the situation. But it is the case that whereas I used to talk about the value of boredom, a lot of people say, well, my child is never bored because my child is always playing some game on the internet or watching a YouTube, or, so they're not saying I'm bored. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the kinds of activities they're involved in are somewhat restrained. They're not going outdoors and they're not learning about the big outdoors. They're not meeting other people in person. Uh, and I believe they're missing something in life by virtue of, of that. So that's, that's a kind of a new problem that I don't always, I'm not always sure I have the answer to that one. And I think it depends a lot on the individual child. Hmm. Well, life is, I mean, life is complex. So, yeah. so we don't have, we have more questions, I guess, than answers. Right. In the end. Right. I, in anyway, I like the idea of reconnecting with this inner need for play in children's life because they do have it. And as I mentioned in my son's example, even they do their homework using play. They, they play their way through homework. Right. <laughs> that's how they function. And I guess that's really important for them to have play in their life. Um, so I, when, um, so depending on the kid's age, etc., we could still leave them to the boredom because then they are bored until they are not anymore because we found something. Right. But, um, I guess the, the most difficult part of it is because it's difficult for us parents. Because when kids would come and, you know, mom, I'm bored, mom, I'm bored, I'm, I'm bored. And in some ways, I guess it's easier for us to entertain them, right. you know, than to live in this kind of emotional situation in the house. Right. Uh, but I guess there is no answer for that. We just have to live through it until, you know, they are gone and do other stuff. You know, one, something that's relevant here is uh, early on in the, uh, in the lockdown of schools and other uh, public places uh, during the uh, coronavirus pandemic, um, children, suddenly all these activities that were keeping children busy uh, were closed. <laughs> They weren't going to school, the after school activities, the formal after school activities were closed, even shopping was out of the question. You were just stuck in the house um, to a considerable degree. You might be able to go outdoors uh, in your own area, but there were limits on what you could do. So um, through the Let Grow Foundation that uh, Lenore Skenazy wrote the book Free Range Kids and I uh, played a role in starting, we did a study of how families adapted to that situation where they were all locked in. And it was a large study, uh, demographically balanced, uh, geographically across the United States, people from all over the country, people of all uh, income levels, people of all uh, ethnic backgrounds and so on, 
Uh, and we did this, and it was a survey of families that had a child be somewhere between the age of eight and 13. So it was kind of middle childhood we were looking at. And um, for and we did this in the so the schools locked down in March of 2020, and then we did this study one month later in April, and then again in May. So again, two months later. And in each case, we surveyed uh, 1,600 families. And in half of the surveys, we address the questions to the parents and in the other half to the children. And the questions were really questions about, many of the questions were about the children's moods, how anxious, how depressed, um, how happy, uh, how active they were about their sleep, about various things like that how they were getting along with their parents. And, and we asked similar questions to the parents about both, we asked the parents questions like this about their children, but also about themselves, how they were doing and about, uh, so the, to make a long story short, the findings ran counter to what so many psychologists and other people were predicting would happen. <laughs> Everybody thought that this would be a terrible psychological experience for the children because their routines are disrupted. What are they going to do? They're going to be so bored. They're going to drive their parents crazy because, uh, and the parents are going to drive the kids crazy because they're all locked together. What we found was overall the children and the parents reports about the children were that the children were less anxious, less depressed than they had been before the pandemic. <laughs> they, the parents reported that the children, there were, they were less fewer conflicts between them and their kids than there had been before. Uh, and in the, and in terms of the questions about what the children are doing, the good news is that the children were discovering because they didn't have their usual routines, they were discovering interesting new things that they like to do. <laughs> and they were, they were playing new games. They were uh, developing new hobbies. They were getting into art. They were reading books for fun rather than because they were assigned in school. They were, some of them were really learning how to, use a musical instrument that they had long owned but never had time to practice before. Some of them, some of them, um, and actually a surprisingly large amount of them wanted to learn how to cook. And some of them were now cooking meals for the family, much to the parents' surprise. <laughs> you know, the parents had never allowed them to cook before because they thought this would just make more of a mess than it would be worth. And, uh, you know, my child really needs to spend their time doing homework and so on and so forth instead of cooking. But now, you know, the homework is reduced and the child wants to do this. So, okay. And it turns out children felt really like this was a, step up they were i know how to cook now that children want to be competent at real world things so when when i submitted this article with all these positive findings for publication the ed, journal editor was appropriately i think just a little bit skeptical he said you know this runs counter to what everybody's predicting well it turns out that then i did a search and there was a study done in the uk using a very different method, but the same findings of teenagers, that they were less anxious. This was a group that had been studied in the long-term way. They were, and then there was another study in the United States of uh, again showing that, and a study in Germany showing that. And so suddenly now, my study wasn't the only one. It was, turns out that everybody who seemed to ask the right questions, not just questions about, so, so many studies just ask negative questions. Like if you ask the question, is your child stressed? <laughs> yeah, sure, my child's stressed. You'll always get answers that kind of fit and they're stressed in this and this way. But if you balance that with questions like, is my child, how is my child dealing with stress? How is my child more happy or less happy? Is my child more stressed or less stressed? Children are always to some degree, we're all stressed to some degree. Yeah. So the important thing was to ask the questions in a way that could elicit 
positive as well as negative answers and then to and then to look at that. So I think that was a very telling study. The other thing that happened during the as a result of this pandemic in the United States, which I think is a positive development, is a lot of families learned you know, I, I really kind of like the idea of my kids uh, being around. <laughs> and my mm -hmm. kids are really pretty good at figuring out what to do and learning. And also, as the pandemic subsided, we've sort of found ways to bring the kids in the neighborhood together. And we have these pods where everybody's been tested and we know they're safe enough. So they've now kind of found neighborhood groups that they didn't have before. The result of that was that the number of families that decided to homeschool their children rather than to send their child to a curriculum-based school doubled in the United States from about 5% wow. of families with school-aged children up to actually 11%. And, um, and most of those have stayed with it as far as we can tell. So it resulted in a kind of a reanalysis of what a child's life should be. And I think a lot of parents came to the conclusion, my child doesn't need to be spending so many hours as the school is demanding at school in this sedentary kind of activity, doing these boring assignments. My child can learn in ways that are far more interesting for my child and can bounce on the couch while learning and do these kinds of things that, that you're saying that children naturally do. Uh, so I think it has had an interesting long-term effect. And I think at least some schools are beginning to, beginning to learn this lesson. Most are not, but some are, and are beginning to realize we need to bring more play. We need to, instead of constantly be increasing the amount of homework and the stress of school, let's decrease it. You know, let's give children more freedom to do the things that children want to do. Um, I think at least that's, and, and again, we're working with schools through the Let Grow Foundation to uh, help promote that idea, bring free play into the school, bring more independent adventures into the schools than they had before. My family story confirms that because during COVID, when school shut down here, that was during winter months. So we had like tons of snow outside. Kids were sent back to home and then school engaged into this online learning meaning sitting the whole day and looking at the computer screen and then kind yes. of trying to learn from that and so my kids were at the first and second grade and i was like if that's only about learning how to read and count there is outside tons of way of doing that without right. you know sitting the whole day to attach to the computer and then that was the best time of our lives. I mean, outside the fact that was pandemic and people were getting sick and dying, but I right. mean, as an experience for our family, kids were outside the whole day. They would come back and knock on the window, meaning, mom, lunchtime, I'm hungry. Do you have something for me? <laughs> <laughs> they would right. eat all dressed up. They would often eat outside, like I'm getting some, you know, hot right. soup outside. They would like eat it, then give me bowls and then get right. back playing outside. And that really, that was, I, that, that was just a terrific time we had. Yeah, I think that's exactly the kind of experience that led a lot of families here to say, well, we're not going to send our children back to school, <laughs> not to school as, as, uh, as we generally know it. Um, and I think a lot of, from watching that online learning, I think a lot of parents realize, wait, you know, for my child, I, I could find a better way to help my child <laughs> learn how to add numbers or, you know, a way that's more interesting to my child, or maybe my child doesn't really even need to learn this because my child already knows this. Why should they have to go through this? I think what a lot of, um, parents homeschooling in the United States, a lot of it is that they recognize that schools really can't accommodate to the individual differences among children, to children's individual needs. We're all different. We all have different interests. We all learn in somewhat different ways. We all have 
you know, one child is ready to read at age four, but another child isn't ready to read until age eight. And not, it doesn't have to do with intelligence. It has to do more with interest, just readiness. I really, I really feel a desire and need to read now. And you can, if you're homeschooling or if you're going to a school like the school my son went to, you can accommodate those interests. And that makes a huge difference because when children are doing what they want to do, what they're ready to do, they are, they're amazing learners. <laughs> when, they're, when they're doing something just because they're required to do it, they're stupid. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> you know, we all are in those situations. We all are way more intelligent than we're, when we're working on something that we are really interested in than we're just doing something because we're being required to do it. Exactly. I have one more question for you about your personal parenthood. What was the most difficult thing for you as a dad? What drove you crazy? <laughs> as a dad. <laughs> so the most difficult thing for me, to be honest, was something I've already kind of referred to, was when my son was going to public school, uh, he was constantly rebelling. He was constantly angry about it. And uh, his mother and I were constantly being called into the school to talk about what are we going to do with this child who <laughs> won't do the assignments the way he's being required to do. And, and my first response was to try to get him to do what the school wanted him to do. I remember you know, he, one of the things they would say is he refuses to learn the, the times tables, uh, you know. And so I remember sitting him at home, setting him on top of a file cabinet and saying, you're not going to get off of here until you've memorized the site. <laughs> you know, I'm not that kind of a father, but I was driven to doing that because I was so tired of being called into the school on these things. And he looked at me and said, I'm not going to do it. I'll sit here all the rest of your life if you're going to say this. So we had these real confrontations about it. And so it was such a relief when we found this alternative school where he could learn in his own ways. And he never had difficulty learning. I wasn't even worried about that. I was worried about the fact that he, that the school he was just making a pain of himself at school and consequently being a pain at home about having to go to school. And he was not the happy person he had been before he ever started school. So that was a, that was a very difficult time um, for me. And it was a great relief. First, when we found this alternative school, and secondly, when from my own research, I found, okay, he's going to be all right here. <laughs> he, we're, he, we're, not, we're not limiting his future by having him do this thing that's very different from conventional schooling. I think so many parents can relate to that, like struggle related to school. And then when we have to become someone we have never wanted to be in the first place because of this pressure coming from outside, like school wanting us to behave in a certain way so that child would do or would do not the homework at that time at that pace things we never asked for but when we have to be there and then we might even go against ourselves because because right. of this pressure that we receive as a parents and it's really that's hard right. to live that's, i think that's exactly right and i think that was one of the points from the you know when I said in that study of children during the pandemic, families during the pandemic, that the parents said, I'm getting along better with my child now than I was when the child was to school. We have fewer conflicts. I think it's because so many conflicts between parents and children are about school. <laughs> You, you as the parent are supposed to make sure your child does homework. And so you're nagging your child to do homework. You, you have to get the child up before the child is ready to get up in the morning in order to get to school. You have to, you have, you know, you've got all these in the, you have to deal with the child's anger and frustrations about school. And so the, these all re, so you take all that away. And there are fewer things to be conflicted about. You could be more on the side of your child and your child could be more on the side of you, your partners in this, rather than conf confronting one another. 
Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Would you mind telling where can people find more of your ideas, work? Where could they read your articles? And Yeah, uh, so so I uh, there's a couple of places. One is I write a regular blog for Psychology Today magazine. And uh, you can find that um, just by Googling Peter Gray, Psychology Today. The name of the blog is Freedom to Learn. And I have many, many essays there about these topics and they're research based. So I refer to research. You can also find, I also have fairly recently created a web page where you can find, um, uh, you can find uh, information about books I've written. You can find uh, and even download many of the academic articles I've written, which are very readable. Um, I don't write that differently when I'm writing an academic article from a, when I'm writing for the general public. Uh, and you can find talks that I've given, um, YouTubes of talks that I've given on that website. And again, that's easy to find, just petergray.org, <laughs> all one word, or just Google Peter Gray's website. And, you can find it. Uh, so though that's another possibility. Also, for people who are on Facebook, I also have a fairly regular presence on my Facebook profile where I recycle a lot of uh, blog posts and there's often discussion there about uh, the ideas that are in those posts. So those are some of the ways to contact me. I'm going to put that into notes. Um... Thank you. Thank you again and for your time and generosity and your laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I love and you laugh. Thank you and uh, have a good day. Thank you. This has been fun, partly because you're laughing also. Yeah. And so I appreciate that very much. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>